All right, we're going to take some time to jump right into the preaching today. Uh, Philippians chapter number 3, verse 17 through 21 is where we're going to spend our time this morning. Uh, This is a a Lenten passage uh, for us, uh, giving us an opportunity to think a little bit about this journey of Lent. And Lent is such an important uh, time in the life, uh, the journey, the liturgical uh, formation of we God's people. It gives us uh, an opportune time to to not just experience uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day in a vacuum, but it always gives us an opportunity to approach this sacred, holy high day of our tradition in a way that hopefully prepares us to fully embrace that, as uh, Karl Barth said, the purpose of our life is not death, but it is resurrection. I want you to think about that. The purpose of our life is not death, but it is resurrection. It is indeed the case that we are a people of resurrection, living in between the reality of life and death, of suffering and triumph, of healing and even of sickness, that God is always attempting to do something new in us. And it is in this way that this newness is requiring from us a certain commitment to the process of life itself. Uh, If you're like me, uh, I am one of these folk who Uh, appreciate life uh, on the upswing when it happens, but not always am appreciative of life on the downswing. Uh, But I have found uh, that every upswing, every mountaintop experience is much more appreciated by me when I can look back down and see my progress. Many of you know that I uh, took a trip uh, to uh, uh, Mount Sinai. I was in Egypt for uh, a week, just, you know, kind of recharging a bit back in October. And I made a trip up the mountain Sinai and I, I, I was trying to get as high as I could. But Mount Sinai uh, got the best of Pastor Mike. Amen. Uh, I was I was I was not physically in shape enough to, to, to traverse and to get to the top of the mountain. I made it about halfway through, and along the way, I stopped at the stations of prayer, and I prayed for uh, our community. I prayed for our churches. I prayed for our families. I prayed for the justice struggles that we've been going through. And, and, and as I, I made it up to the halfway point, I looked back on my journey, and even though I did not make it to the top, I had a sense of appreciation that my journey was literally characterized by the, the, the rigor of the path I had to tread. And child of God, as we make our path to Lent or through Lent to resurrection, I want you to know that there is indeed glory in your story. There is a testimony in your journey. There is strength that comes from your struggle And there is indeed new life that comes from our physical and spiritual transformations. And so in this way, Philippians chapter number three, verse number 17, picking up uh, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, the words of scripture read like this, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example of you have in us. Paul is compelling the new church he had helped to plant right here in the church of Philippi, a very uh, militaristic city, a strategic outpost of the Roman Empire uh, that literally was a space and a spot. It was a colony, if you will, that allowed the Roman Empire's reach to be much further than the city of Rome. It is very similar uh, to the United States uh, empire, imperialistic reaches that we have bases all through and outposts all throughout the world, which allows the United States interest to be represented far beyond the the geographical body of the United States uh, boundaries here in North America. The diabolical nature of empires is that we are always wanting to be Uh, far beyond that which we already are. And so Paul is continuing in this church of Philippi to say to them, hey, 
Join in imitating me. Follow me as I follow Christ, he says in another passage. Verse number 18 says, for many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Woo, what a declaration. And I have often told you of them. And now I tell you, even with tears, their end is destruction. Their God is the belly. And their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Verse number 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. I'm going to speak uh, for a few moments from uh, simply this Lenten message. Uh, a new me is what I need. A new me is what I need. I'm going to talk about the process of transformation that leads to a new me. Amen. Let's pray for a few moments and invite the spirit of the living God to be present in our sermonic time. God, in the name of Jesus, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet. Thank you, O oh God, that you continue to call us to yourself through the worship and the singing and the preaching and our actions, Lord God, in the world. And I pray, God, that as this moment of preaching, uh, God, happens in this time of worship, that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and the hearers of your word, and we'll say, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Come on, put it in the chat. I need a new me. I need a new me. A new me is what I need. Amen. I, I want to uh, make sure that you appreciate during this Lenten season that uh, all transformation requires a process. All transformation requires a process. And for many of us, uh, you and I are continuing to appreciate that the process for our transformation is often uh, characterized by starts and stops, that not all transformation happens at the same time. Lent allows us the opportunity to embrace this truth that we can be made new. And we can be made new uh, by recycling the experiences and those moments in our lives that have happened previously to us. And we are also made new by the things in our lives that we have yet to experience. That in many respects, God is a recycling God, meaning that God takes all of the things that happen in our lives and God recycles it and God repurposes it. But it's also important for you and I to appreciate that God is also doing some new things. Uh, in the biblical text of Genesis, we understand that in the beginning, the scripture says there was God and the earth was without form or void and that God moved on the face of the earth and, and the, 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 the theological kind of um, uh, commitment to creation uh, through what we know about God is that God created something out of nothing. Ex nihilo is the word that is used. And, and this idea that God is creating in us something new out of nothing, paired with God is recycling and repurposing uh, a new thing based off of what we've gone through uh, in our lives. The highs, the lows, the wins, the losses, the victories, and the defeats. I want you to realize, child of God, that it's important for you to embrace all of the ways in which God seeks to make us new. And it is such a powerful truth. It is such good news that how you are today 
is not necessarily what you will be tomorrow. That your circumstances of today will not necessarily be the reality of your tomorrow. That God is always making you new. But the process is a part of our newness. How many of you can say that I am always in process? Praise God. Uh huh. I'm always in process. That there's always a process of metamorphosis, of transformation. That I'm learning new things, and I'm 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 letting go of some things, and 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 I'm 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 wrestling with some things. That there's always, and there will always be a process of transformation. I, I, I'm compelled by this, 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 this image of the metamorphosis that happens from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That, that in many respects, the, the, the caterpillar uh, transforms itself into something beautiful and boundless, if you will. Uh, if, if, if you were to just appreciate and go along with me, give you a little science lesson this morning, or is this a biology? I don't know. Uh, science and biology give you a little bit of everything this morning. Praise God. That all butterflies, they start as tiny eggs about the size of a pen. And that female butterflies deposit on leaves in small clusters. And these eggs typically gestate for about a week or two, and at that point, they hatch into larva. Uh, the, that, that the pre-stage of a butterfly, if you will, uh, must start with an egg that is planted or that is literally uh, 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 placed uh, as eggs on leaves. And I want you to appreciate, child of God, that uh, all newness has to start with the spirit of the feminine, amen, that, that, that creation is birthed out of this, 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 this ability to, to, to be gestating in a, in a womb, in a place of, of life, if you will. And it's really cool to appreciate that God, we can understand God is not just the God uh, from a masculine uh, uh, anthropomorphic point of view. But that all through nature and even in moments of scripture, we also see God described in the feminine language, which is to say that God is not male or female, amen, but all inclusive God's description and God's activity can encompass both. And I want you to know, child of God, that there are some things that God is trying to birth in us. Hmm. Do I have a witness in here today that perhaps some of the newness that we are experiencing will be a result of God birthing some things in us, right? And in the process of the birthing, uh, that the eggs that the, the, the butterfly lay that eventually turn into larva, that it's really cool and important to realize that larva do not look beautiful in their inception. That if you take a look at larva, uh, even even the, the larva that characterize flies are called maggots. Amen. If you saw a maggot anywhere near you, you would not be uh, uh, mesmerized in a positive way. You would not be feeling like uh, you are beholding something beautiful. Uh, but butterflies in their larva stage are called caterpillars. And, and, and we know the caterpillars are voracious. They consume grass, leaves, and other plant material. And listen, the, the caterpillars grow 1,000 times larger than their birth weight. And, and I loved when I was studying this that they attribute the, the, the growth of the caterpillar to pre be preparing itself for the next stage in its life cycle. That the growth of the caterpillar, right, that it puts to work the calories that it is gathering, that all of the things that the caterpillar is, is, is consuming will be transformed into the energy necessary. Lord, I feel like preaching this thing this morning. I hope y'all coming along with me, all you with that Holy Ghost preaching imagination. Amen. That all the things that the, the caterpillar has endured and has consumed will be used to, to create and catalyze a startling transformation. And that transformation is known as the pupa. 
<coughs> and the pupa uh, then creates a crystallis where the literal caterpillar goes into a bit of a cocoon. And, and it's then in this cocoon that the caterpillar breaks down entirely on a cellular level and will reorganize itself into a new form until it breaks out of the cocoon that could no longer hold it. And it will become a butterfly that literally flies further than the egg, the caterpillar, or the cocoon would ever imagine or understand itself to have the capacity to do. Who I wonder, child of God, if you can see this journey of Lent and many moments in your spiritual, physical, emotional, psychological, vocational, familial life as more than the current stage you're in. Lord, help me to preach to myself. Amen. That there's more to your process than just the birthing phase. There's more to your process than just the caterpillar stage. There's more to your process than just the lupa or the cocoon stage. That there's even more to your process than you just floating around like a butterfly. That all of these stages are required if we are going to become new. And if, again, the purpose of life is not death but resurrection. How many of you know that the resurrection is always about God doing something new? God doing something new in your home. God doing something new in your relationships. God doing something new in your family. God doing something new in your vocation. God doing something new in your body that is racked with pain. And God doing something new in the mind that uh, is succumbing to the forces of nihilism and, 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 and depression and, and anxiety, debilitating paralysis. God is wanting to do something new. And this is why I find the passage in Philippians to be so powerful for us this morning because it is describing what newness could look like for us as we make this Lenten journey. That the process, although it is laborious, and although it does have multiple phases, the process is always something that we must go through. We must jump into. We must engage. The, the, the writer Paul here is giving both a plea and an exhortation. He's both calling out to us with a, 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 an encouragement. Hey, child of God. Hey, follower of Jesus. Make sure that you are open to the newness, he's encouraging us to make sure we're open to it. But then he's also uh, making a plea, a, a, a demand that is growing out of his concern for our situatedness in the world. He's encouraging and pleading to us. He's acting out of a sense of deep uh, pastoral care, but also out of a sense of deep desperation and concern. Don't allow this moment in your life to determine or overly define the depth and breadth of your journey to transformation. I do believe that there are several things that the Philippians had to contend with that just like Jesus and Paul and others living in the world and like we who live in the world, the, the Philippian is being told in no uncertain terms that you must ensure that as your journey commences, you are always clear about who you are and whose you are, meaning that you are always in process, process and the God of all creation is always the one processing you Woo, amen I, I i i don't know if that gets you excited or makes you nervous that the god of all creation is the one processing you amen that you are not being left up to your own devices but god is processing you god has a plan for you god has a calendar for you god has some work for you to do. And it is this work 
that God is inviting you and I to lean into as we go through this season of Lent. And the first thing that I think the scripture lifts up that I want you and I to fully embrace and appreciate is that we are being called in the biblical text not to waste our minds. Uh, come on, somebody put that in the chat and just declare to yourself or to your neighbor. Try not to be a hater this morning, but just tell them don't waste your mind. Uh-huh. Don't waste your mind. Verse number 19, the scripture says that the glory of those who are living as enemies of Christ, the, 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 the bellies of those who are living as enemies of Christ, that they're in the destruction, but their glory is in their shame. And then he goes on to say that their minds are set on earthly things. How many of you know that there is a danger for many of us that we could, you know, waste our minds on things that do not deserve our attention? That our minds, uh, they used to say, is a terrible thing to waste. I don't know if you remember that commercial growing up. Amen. That a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Well, I'm here to tell you that it is still true that you and I must not waste our minds. And how do we waste our minds? By fixating on earthly things. Now, the, the fixation on earthly things is, is not a commentary about you and I becoming so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. But the writer, I believe, is attempting to challenge us to not allow earthly things to be the ways in which we allow our minds to make sense and discern our call, our purpose, our function, that the, 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 those who live as the enemies of Christ, that their God is their belly, which means that their mind is literally working and operating from below versus from operating from on high. We have in our theological conversations this idea that sometimes when you start theology from below, you limit the, the expansiveness of what the un untethered and, and, and unbound power of God is able to do. That if all of God's power must operate through the formulas of human understanding, how many of you know some of us wouldn't have made it out of the last situation we were in? <laughs> Amen. Some of us wouldn't have made it. How many know that there had to be a miracle wrapped up in the, 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 the normativity of the mundane and the regular? That God had to throw a miracle, a curveball. Can you imagine uh, all you baseball fans? The first time somebody saw a curveball. I mean, they were used to the they were used to the the fast pitch, and they they may have been used, amen, to to a pitch in the dirt, but a curveball, a a ball that literally starts on the inside, moves to the outside, and comes back to the inside to the original senses of the person at the plate. They may think that was some magic. But in actuality, that was just some skill that folk had never seen before. Uh, I'm here to tell you, God is saying to many of you, your mind is a terrible thing to waste if you are allowing your mind to be so tethered to that which we know is not large enough to hold what God is seeking and trying to do. You will have a limited imagination if your mind is fixated on earthly things. If your mind is fixated on describing wealth and power through the lens of a failing empire. If your mind is fixated on the way the world describes power and success. That your mind is a terrible thing to waste. If your only description of what it means to be purposeful, of what it means to be loving, of what it means to be joyful is fixated on the, the, the limited, uh, the small uh, constricting descriptions of earth child of God we are a resurrected heavenly people and I want you to know in your mind you better have the ability to stretch your mind so you can have a radically new you I mean can you imagine uh, what it would look like if your mind began to reach the the flexibility 
of God's eternal wisdom and will. Woo! I mean, can you imagine all the things that we could be and we could accomplish, all of the justice that we could enact, all of the care that we could extend, all of the belonging that we could create if our minds were as big as the mind of God who created the universe. Amen. How many know that God didn't just create earth? God just didn't create the solar system, but God's mind was so expansive that we are still catching up to what God created. Lord, I want you to know, child of God, that your mind, your mind is a terrible thing to waste. And so one question I have for you, is your mind wasted by focusing too much on things below? And again, I'm not talking about you uh, ignoring the injustice and ignoring the challenges in your life. I'm not talking about you walking through life with your head buried in the sand with a fake spirituality. No, I'm talking about you purposing in your heart and in your life that my life will be determined by this sense of God's divine and righteous plan that God's ways are not my ways that God's thoughts transcends the thoughts of this age and this world and where must you cultivate holy imagination where must you and I open our minds so we can discern the absurd and overcome the shamelessness or the shame of this world. I want you to know, child of God, that we are being invited during this season of Lent, during a time when we know how the end will, will literally uh, uh, overwhelm us with resurrection, that on the way, God is asking us, uh, don't, don't allow your mind to be wasted on on earthly things. Don't chase the money uh, and then not chase the change that God wants to create in your life. Don't chase uh, the position and lose the authority God wants to bestow on you. Don't chase the fame and then become unknown to God. No child of God, in all things, get your mind focused on that which literally helps us to discern the absurd and overcome the shame. The second thing that the scripture lifts up that I want to uh, say to us is that if we are going to be a people who are literally becoming transformed, we must reclaim our citizenship. Come on, say that in the chat. Reclaim our citizenship. Uh, listen, uh, some of us have to claim it because we've never made a decision to follow Jesus fully with our heart and our mind and our soul. We've never fully made a decision to ensure that our spirit and our soul have been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. So for some of us, it's the first decision you must make. Claim your citizenship. For some of us who've been walking with God for a while, we have to reclaim our citizenship. Uh, no matter who you are, where you are, it's always a question before us. For the follower of Jesus, whose citizenship will we claim as having the priority? Martin Luther King uh, says it like this, that every true Christian is a citizen of two worlds, the world of time and the world of eternity. The Christian finds himself in the paradoxical situation of having to be in the world, but not yet of the world. And so although the Christian finds themselves in the colony of time, their ultimate allegiance is to the empire of eternity. Woo. You may find yourself in the colony of time, but how many of you feel something eternal pulling on you? Jesus, help me. How many feel something uh, eternal kind of tugging at the, the strings of your heart? How many feel something eternal calling you out of the limitation of this colony of time into something that is literally more life-giving? The writer Paul in the passage then in verse number 20 says that our citizenship is in heaven. 
And I want you to know whether you are a new believer, an unbeliever, or you are a strong believer, you and I must reclaim our citizenship, particularly living in the United States of America, the Roman Empire of this age. Paul would be telling us and Jesus would be demonstrating to us that my kingdom is not of this world. And that while it's great in the United States of America, uh, in many churches all across the country, folk pledging allegiance to the flag, folk conflating their political ideology with their Christian theology, folk thinking that God came to save the United States of America. I'm here to tell you God's love for the world is not uh, uh, lessened or, 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 or tamed by the United States of America's political, geopolitical priorities. That you and I, if we are going to reclaim our citizenship, we must become global citizens. Yes, we must become universal kingdom minded folk meaning that what it what it what does it mean for you and i to not allow our citizenship to be chained to the nation we live in what does it mean for you and i to not be overly bound to nationalistic ties or social categories setting our minds on things below what does it mean for you and i to keep reminding ourselves that all of these titles ought to be seen as descriptive for us Meaning they may describe where you live. They may describe your cultural background. They may describe parts of your identity, but they do not fully express your citizenship. That is why you can have Christians fleeing from Haiti and Christians fleeing from Cameroon and Christians fleeing from Mexico and South America and, and, and Latin America coming across a man, a man-made border. Lord have mercy. And you'll have Christians on this side of the man-made border, not able to see the humanity of the Christians on the other side of a man-made border. Why is that? Because we have forsaken our citizenship that is in heaven for a citizenship that is in the earth. And I'm here to tell you, God has no need for a follower of Jesus whose citizenship is so bound to the country you live in that you can't openly embrace the follower of Jesus uh, that is coming literally from another place that God created. I don't know. I'm preaching hard up in here to myself. I'm hoping you're getting something out of this this morning that God wants you and I to have a citizenship that is in heaven. And that is why our response to Ukraine must not uh, be in isolation, but we must also respond to the Palestinian violence that is it being experienced, to the violence in Somalia, to the violence in Oakland, to the violence in Rio de Janeiro, to the violence in Chicago, to the violence in Selma, to the violence all across the world. That literally, for God so loved the world, not the United States of America. God so loved the world. Not black folks living in the hood. God so loved the world. Not the wealthy who are hoarding all of the resources. God loved the world. And all of us who are citizens of the kingdom of God must have a global universal outlook. And so my question to some of us today, child of God, uh, is how does reclaiming our citizenship found in heaven expand our capacity for belonging in the earth? How can you and I, how can we who literally are able to reclaim our citizenship in heaven how does it allow us to see that we can create more belonging in the world that my boundaries are not uh dictated by the elections my boundaries are not dictated by the the capitalistic and the imperialistic warmongering projects of this age but whoever god calls whatever god has created my whole life's work is to bear witness that my citizenship is in heaven and because my citizenship is in heaven i have broad boundless capacities to create conditions where everyone can belong and my allegiances there uh therein are now an expression of my 
citizenship in heaven. That when I'm an elected official, my 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 literally my 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 citizenship is in heaven and it reflects that I am expanding the goods of this nation state to everyone. I'm thinking of the unhoused when I'm a elected official. I'm thinking of Pookie and Ray Ray when I'm an elected official. I'm thinking of the undocumented, the poor. I'm thinking of even the wealthy and those who build castles for themselves, knowing that as you build castles for yourself, there are, in many respects, a prison you have built for yourself that keeps you from literally experiencing all of creation. And then the final thing I'll say to us on this Sunday where I'm asking you to seek transformation, a new you, a powerful, powerful verse. Number 21, that Christ will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of Christ's glory. Listen to this, that Christ will transform the body of our humiliation. That our bodies, the, 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 the limitation and the struggles that continue to humble us. Humiliation is not meant here as a, a, a process to rob you of your dignity. But humiliation literally in this context is speaking to how our bodies are literally suffering and being broken by life and by sickness and by racism and xenophobia and sexism. Our bodies are suffering under the weight of sin, both systemic and structural, that God will take our bodies that are being broken and literally transform them into his glorified body, a body that is not broken by sin, but is literally, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, transfigured by the glory of Christ. I want you to know, child of God, that sometimes the new journey or the journey we are seeking for newness requires us to surrender to transformation. That God wants you and I to surrender to the transforming power of God's spirit through the work and the works and the process. Brother Anthony has been uh, my trainer for the last four months, three or four months, and and, 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 and we work out several times a week. And, and I must declare my, my body is perpetually sore. <laughs> Praise God. You know, I used to be able to get up out of a, out of a chair and, and, and I would not feel anything. I would just get up and it wouldn't have no problems. But the process of my transformation has caused my body to become in tune with the 640 muscles that make up this humiliated body, praise God. This lowly body, this body that is in need of transformation. That there was a time when I could just move and not have to worry about any soreness or pain or struggle because my body had gotten used to its current form. But the moment I started to do a little bit of work to transform myself, I had to surrender to the commands and the demands of this trainer who would push me in places I did not know I needed to be pushed, who would ask me to do things I did not know was physically possible, who would require me to do a number of reps that would cause my body to give out in fatigue. But over the process of me surrendering to the transformation, even though it hurts for me to get up out of a chair, I can walk longer. 
Even though it pains me to roll out the bed, I can sleep better. Even though I, I, I have all kinds of exhaustion at the end of my workout, I could run longer and faster. Why? Because the process of transformation, though painful and though sore and though difficult, it builds a new me from the inside out. We used to sing a song back in the day. It says, something on the inside, working its way to the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Child of God, I want you to know today, we all need a transformed, internal, resurrecting process that is ongoing, but discernible. It will have moments where you can say, mm, this is this is that. I've made a jump. I've made a leap. I've, I've, I've hit a threshold. But I am going to stay committed because where I am today is not where I need to end tomorrow. If you're here today and you'll say, I need a new me, come on, let's take a few moments and pray. God, I pray today for the child of God in this place that will be honest and say, God, I need a new me. I need you to help me start anew. I need you to help me imagine a way forward that is reflective of a mind that is not held hostage by things from below. I need a new me, oh God, that allows me to be clear about the ways in which I must reclaim my citizenship because I've been seduced into believing that being an American is more important than being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I've been seduced into believing that these social identities that should be descriptors of my, my being have become prescribers of my purpose. So God, I need to reclaim my citizenship in heaven so I can be a global, universal, inclusive human being that stewards all of creation not just the creation i like but god as you transform me into this butterfly that knows no bounds god i pray that i will transform by surrendering to your process your first step for us god is to Say yes to you, yes to your ways, yes to the life you live, yes to the saving power of your spirit that literally, as the scripture says, brings everything into subjectivity. It brings everything under the authority of your will and your purpose. Thank you, God. Thank you for the transforming process we will experience in Lent. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, people of the way. All you who like to worship with us in person next week, we'll see at 10 a.m. Come with your mask. Get tested 48 hours before you arrive. And let's worship God together. God bless you in Jesus' name.